right, so let me uh, let me dive in here. So the, the topics today are just basically, we're gonna talk a little bit about anchoring theory, uh, some of the local conditions and practices, uh, some enhanced techniques, and again, some learning resources. So the, uh, the goal of anchoring is to have your boat securely attached to the bottom while avoiding other boats and grounding. And then there's one other super important goal of anchoring, and that's to get a good night's sleep. So let's talk some of the basic equipment. Obviously there's, there's anchors. And when I'm giving this talk at the boat show, there's almost always that someone pipes up and says, uh, all right, so which one's the best? And generally my answer to that is it depends on, on where you're at and what you're doing. Uh, I'll give, give you a small example. Uh, when I first started going down to the British Virgin Islands, they had uh, these CQRs on all the boats. And every time I dropped one of those CQRs into that light fluffy coral sand down there, uh, it would just lay on its side because of that big heavy hinge on it and, and the coral sand was too light for the nose to dig in and flip up that heavy hinge. So I'd have to throw on my snorkel gear, go down and tip the anchor up manually, stick it into the sand and then it would hold fine. Um, now when I go down there, all the boats have deltas on it that have much lighter um, shaft on them and they set most of the time fairly well. So it, it, again, it kind of depends a little bit on what you're in in the way of an environment as to maybe which anchor is best. Um, they all work fairly well. Um, you can end up with slightly different scenarios. The Bruce anchor on the lower right isn't very pointed. And if you get it around a bunch of seaweed, it may not set as easily as, as one of the anchors that has a sharp point on it that might poke through the seaweed. But uh, we're, we're wandering into the weeds here at that point. So the next piece of equipment that you need is your road, the, the attachment from the anchor to the boat, which usually involves chain, potentially some line, uh, shackles, swivels, and so forth. And then if you have all road, all chain road, then you're gonna want a, a snubber where you can take the weight of the uh, anchor and the chain and the, and the potential pull from wind and waves and so forth and put it onto a cleat rather than leaving it on the chain that goes around your windlass. And of course, speaking of windlass, then if you've got a heavy anchor and heavy, heavy chain, uh, too, back, too back breaking to pull it up by hand so you'd have a windlass to pull up the, uh, the ground tackle. And then there's some other suggested secondary gear, uh, a secondary anchor with some road attached to it. Uh, personally, I like as a secondary anchor, uh, the, the Fortress, which is a Danforth that looks like this, except that it's made out of aluminum. And the advantage of that is that the, uh, my Danforth, or excuse me, my Fortress anchor is the size of a 44 pound Danforth, but it only weighs 15 pounds. So it's a lot easier to get out of my uh, cockpit locker and get into the dinghy if, or, or carry it up to the bow and deploy it if I need to. Spool a stern tie line. I've got the, the 600 foot spool on, on our boat. A trip line, something that you can tie to the, to the anchor to uh, be able to pull it out from under a rock or under a cable or something like that. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. Uh, some kind of a float to tie to the end of your trip line uh, or to maybe mark a stern tie line. If you're worried about people uh, running over it, you can mark it with, a, with some kind of a float. Uh, handheld depth sounders are very handy. I've, we've got one on our boat we use regularly. Uh, primary place where we use it is if we're stern tied, our depth sounder is up at the mast and uh, but our, we're backed into a sloped bottom. And so our rudder is in shallower water than up in front where the depth sounder is. And so the question then becomes, are we in deep enough water that when the tide goes out, our, anchor, our rudder is safe? 
So we use the handheld depth sounder off the stern of the boat to make sure that we've got enough water to keep the, uh, the rudder safe. The other place where we use the handheld depth sounder pretty regularly is if we're out exploring in kayaks or in, in our dinghy and we come across a little bay that looks like a really neat spot to anchor the next time we're up in that area, uh, we can go in and do a little survey to make sure that it's not three feet deep, which kind of semi disqualifies it as an anchoring spot, uh, or um, find out that, hey, this would be a great little spot to pull into and do a stern tie and, and have our own little private cove. So uh, handy device, they're not terribly expensive. I think the one I bought several years ago was $125, still using it, so a uh, worthwhile device. Uh, some kind of powerful flashlight, um, primarily used if the wind comes up really strong in the middle of the night and you're um, wanting to check and see if you're dragging and maybe more importantly whether your neighbor upwind is dragging onto you. And some way of marking your road and your chain uh, so that you know how much you have out. And then lastly, uh, potentially a range finder, uh, kind of handy. I had a, a boat come in and anchor next to me several years ago and I, I looked over at him and I went, guys, I'm a little concerned that you're a little too close to us. And they kind of pointed this thing at me and said, we're 158 yards from you. And I went, yeah, never mind, you're fine. <laughs> so um, can be, distances on the water can be deceiving. So you know, range finder can be very handy. Am I too close to shore? Am I too close to that next boat? Uh, handy device to determine that. By the way, if anyone has any questions along the way, feel free to pop in and, and ask. All right, so anchoring theory. The, the, this is probably the most important single item in, in anchoring to understand, is that these anchors, as you can look at this, the angle between the shaft and the plow is typically about 25 or 30 degrees. And these are designed to have the shaft pulled somewhat parallel to the bottom so that the plow digs itself down. It tends to pull itself down into the mud, the sand, or whatever. If you pull on that shaft at an angle equal to about 30 degrees, you'll see that that plow is no longer digging itself into the bottom. It's just sliding across the bottom. And this is the reason why having enough scope out is important. Because at a two to one scope, in other words, if you're in 25 feet of water and you have 50 feet of chain or line out and the wind comes up, your angle down to your anchor is 30 degrees, which we just noticed it makes that anchor totally ineffective other than the fact that it weighs X number of pounds laying down there. And as you go <clears throat> up in scope, the angle decreases. And as you can see, the holding power of the angle of the anchor increases. And this is why all the books say you want to be up in that range of seven to one in order to get the maximum holding power uh, out of your anchor. Okay. Now, the why do people use chain on their anchors? There's two reasons. One is that if your anchor is down on some sort of rocky bottom or around some coral, uh, some of that stuff, if, it, if, there's, if you're using just nylon line, it can chafe through your line. So it's a good idea to have some chain just to present chafe. But the other primary reason for it is weight. If I have a strictly a nylon line and no chain, and the wind comes up at all, even to 10 knots, you're gonna end up with pulling on your anchor at that blue line where there's, it's purely your scope and that's the angle you're gonna get. Now, if I have a bunch of chain out and the wind comes up to 10 or 20 knots, you're gonna end up with that black line situation because there's not enough wind to pick up and uh, pull all of that chain up to a taut position where it's in the same position as the blue line. And any angle that it 
that it doesn't get lifted to creates a pull on the anchor at the at the red line or at least something similar to it so you can see that effectively chain adds scope unless the wind comes up strong enough to actually pull the chain up uh, totally straight which takes a fair amount of wind so it uh, it is um, you know, and if that wind comes up really strong, then you're going to want to have all the roads you have out, get out to the seven to one, 10 to one. But if you're running on all chain road in summertime conditions, then anchoring on like four to one is perfectly fine, mostly because of this phenomenon. All right, then swing room is a, is a consideration. How much room do you need between your neighbor and you? You'll notice that I, in this diagram, I've set this up so that these uh, boats are not, their, their swing circles overlap each other somewhat, which isn't really a problem for most of the time because usually the boat, if the wind changes or the current changes, all the boats are gonna swing around and go the same direction. So the chances of them overlapping each other are pretty slim. Now, the, the only place where that can change and it won't usually change enough for this to be for these boats to hit each other either even under that circumstance is if you have one boat that has you know 200 feet of chain out and another boat next to it that has 50 feet of chain and 150 feet of line on it and a very mild wind comes up going the other direction uh, the boat with a line on it is going to swing 150 feet and maybe pull a little bit of its chain. So it's going to swing around and move 170 feet. The boat with all chain out in that light wind is probably going to turn around and move maybe 20 feet. It's going to move a little bit of chain and then it's going to just sit there on that pile of chain and, and not move anymore. So you can end up with with boats that have disparate road uh, swinging different amounts. So one of the things I always look at when I'm pulling up to a boat near me is, do I see line going down into the water or do I see chain going down in the water? It tells me a little bit about how that boat's likely to act uh, when the wind changes direction in a, in a summertime wind. Um, swing room. Uh, long time ago, there was an article in 48 North and, and someone wrote and said, your, your swing room, when you've got 100 feet of road out, uh, isn't anywhere close to 100 feet because of the angle of the line going down. And uh, that actually, that article caused me to write in and say that is in, incorrect. You're still very close to 100 feet. So you'll notice uh, up in the little diagram of, at the top, at four to one, uh, when you've got 100 feet out, it only decreases your swing by three three percent. So you're at you're swinging 97 feet instead of 100. And at seven to one, it only de decreases at one percent. And then of course you have to add the length of your boat on, and double it to get your diameter. So uh, basically, just consider the fact that if you have 100 feet of line out, your bow is is able to move 100 feet in a 360 degree circle from that anchor. Um, so that's what that diagram is about. Calculating your scope. So the appropriate thing to do is get the depth of the water and then add any increase of tide that you're going to get. So when I anchor, I always look at the tide books and I'm gonna determine how much the tide, where, I'm, where, where am I at now? I might be at a five foot tide. And how much is the tide going up overnight? Let's say it's gonna go up to 10 feet and it's gonna go down to zero feet. And I use the amount that it's gonna go up to add into my calculation of my, the, how much scope I need to put out it when I'm in the deepest water I'm gonna be in. And I use the amount that it's going to go out to make sure that I don't anchor in 10 feet of water when I'm gonna lose five feet and I've got a six foot keel. That's gonna leave me only with my keel sticking in the water a foot, so, or into the mud a foot. So you, the, 
determining your tide situation when you're getting ready to anchor is, is a good idea. We'll talk a little more about that later. And then, of course, you want to add in the height of the bow roller um, to the water because your anchor is actually attached up at the bow. And this, this is not hugely significant on sailboats, but if you get on some power boats, you can have that anchor up, you know, eight, nine, ten feet out of the water, and it fairly significantly changes your scope calculation. And again, I for local summer conditions around here, I usually use four to one. So I multiply the sum of all that. And here's an example. If I'm in 25 feet of water and the tide's going up six feet, and I've got four feet to my bow roller, that adds up to 35 times four. So that's 140 feet. And I've got my chain marked every 25 feet, so I'd probably run out to 150 and set my anchor and call it good for the night. Local conditions. Most of our harbors around here are mud. If you get too shallow, 20 feet or below, you're likely to run into some seaweed. Most of the harbors are pretty protected from waves, so-so um, for wind. Uh, our tide swings locally are like 10 to 14 feet uh, between here and it gets a little, little, little wider swing as you go down towards Olympia. Now, if you go up north towards Alaska, uh, they go up over 20 feet. In Juneau, the tide swings are regularly 25 feet. So it, it, you have to really take into account the amount of tide you're going to get. And of course, our anchorages can be crowded, which is one of the reasons why we tend to use four to one around here a lot, because if you're using seven to one, you're taking up more than your fair share of real estate. So again, what works locally, four to one, plow, the plow anchor with a fortress backup, two to 300 feet of, of all chain if you can carry it on the boat. If not, I like to take the double the boat length in chain and then add a couple hundred feet of line to it. Uh, choosing a good anchorage, find a protection from wind and waves, find an appropriate depth that you can anchor in, good, good swing room, good bottom, and take into account your surroundings. Part of, and take into account part of the surroundings is the other boats around you. If you've got a boat that you're pulling in and thinking about anchoring next to and you notice that they're having a party on board and you're wanting to go to sleep early, might not be the best place to anchor. Um, also, if you're planning on having a party, you might want to pull out and anchor a little ways away from the other boats. <clears throat> Again, read your cruising guides. Um, for example, in Wagner's, if you go up to Desolation Sound, there's some of the anchorages up there that they will tell you, hey, this anchorage used to be a um, logging camp. And so we've heard reports of a bunch of cables down at the bottom. So if you find that, you may that may prompt you to put on your, uh, your um, okay, I'm drawing a blank. Um, I would say trip line, is that trip, correct? Yeah. That's the one, thank you, trip line, and so that if you get stuck on a cable, you can rescue your anchor. Um, listen to VHF for the weather, or look at your, your weather app, look at uh, uh, predict winds or something like that, and determine what you're, what you're expecting. Uh, look up your tides and currents, read your charts. And then a standard anchoring procedure is find your spot and, and circle it slowly. You're looking to see if the bottom is, is sloped too much to anchor on or uh, looking for uh, maybe rocks down there. So circle it slowly if you're in unfamiliar waters. Uh, calculate your desired scope. Approach upwind so that the wind is going to blow you back onto your, uh, you know, tighten your chain and or up current uh, bring the boat to a stop drop the anchor down so that it's on the bottom and then start backing up and laying out the road as you're backing up and then set the anchor and what the what this involves typically is to put the boat in reverse and just and and again depends on you're on a on a sailboat a powerboat and and what you have for an engine and a propeller you, the idea is to start pulling on the anchor gently at first so that you're allowing the anchor to work its way down into the mud 
fairly deep before you put too much pressure on it. For example, if you're on a, on a twin engine powerboat and you drop the anchor down to the bottom and put both engines in reverse, there's no way you're going to set that anchor. You're just going to go farming and dig a furrow down the, down under the bottom because it, you're going to put too, so much power on that the anchor won't be able to get down into the mud. So the trick to that is to put one engine in reverse for a, for a second or two and then put it in neutral and then put the other engine in reverse for a second or two and kind of just slowly work your way up to where you can see the anchor chain come up and kind of go taut and then start working your way up to longer and longer in reverse. Now, once you get the anchor set, uh, or maybe even before, it's a good idea to put on your snubber and secure the uh, anchor to a cleat. Um, if, you have, if you have chain and then line, it's not so hard. You let out your road and then just take the line and, and cleat it to uh, tie it to a cleat. Uh, but if you've got chain, you need to put the snubber on and then tie that to a cleat and then let some extra chain out so that the weight is on the snubber, not on the on the windlass. And then set an anchor alarm if you want to and turn on your anchor light uh, if you're not just doing a lunch hook. A few tips, uh, communications between crew and boat to boat. Um, my wife and I have got a, a, been doing this long enough that we do all of it with hand signals and uh, no, no yelling back and forth, so which works pretty, pretty easily. Um, the, and boat to boat, uh, for example, we, uh, one time I was pulled into Echo Bay and there was another boat kind of off to my side and another boat came and we'd been anchored there for a while and the current and there's a little bit of an eddy in echo bay and the current had changed so we and we were both on all chain roads so we would swung around and just were sitting there on our chain and our anchors were actually behind us and another boat came in and did what normally would be very appropriate he pulled up behind the boat next to me probably a hundred feet 150 feet and started dropping, getting ready to drop his anchor there and, and then back down off of that, thinking that our anchors were out in front of us. And I could see the people on the boat next to me were all concerned because this boat was dropping his hook right on top of theirs. And they weren't saying anything. So I finally just stood up and yelled to that boat. I said, hey, by the way, the current swung us around and our anchors are behind us. I think you're probably just about on top of that guy's anchor. And the guy said, oh, great. Thanks for telling me and went off and and did the appropriate thing. So it doesn't take an awful lot if you just communicate with people to uh, help get things going in a, in a good direction. Um, generally, the boats that are anchored there first sort of have the, uh, right away is the wrong word for it, but it's sort of a polite courtesy to, if they say, hey, I'm really worried that you're too close to me to, to move a little bit. Uh, if they're stern tied, then you may want to stern tie so that you don't swing into them and so forth. Um, sometimes, um, especially like up in Alaska and some places where I've been kind of nervous about getting into a spot, I will eke my way into a, into a spot, drop a hook and back up without really checking my circle. And I'm going to hop in the dinghy with my handheld depth sounder and go out and do a survey of the area all the way around where I could swing without risking the boat to do it. So that can be a useful, useful tip. Uh, don't be afraid or embarrassed about re-anchoring. We've all done it. I've, I've pulled up a whole wad of seaweed and got, oops, okay. <laughs> I'm, take all the seaweed off the anchor, find a little deeper water and then reset the anchor. Um, so, and if you if you read that it's a rocky bottom, then set a trip line. Um, I give you an example on this. My wife and I were up in Desolation Sound, Walsh Cove, and if you read Wagner's, they say it's a rocky bottom. So I grabbed my trip line and my little float, and I walked up to the bow, and set the anchor, and turned around to come back into the into the cockpit and I tripped over the trip line that I had forgotten to put on the anchor. 
So I held it up to my wife and I said, oops. And I said, well, the anchor is already down. We might as well enjoy our evening and we'll see where we land in the morning. Next morning, we get up and we start pulling up our chain and we get right over the anchor and it's rock solid. It's like stuck. So I start thinking through, all right, what have I got that I can rig up something to slide down this line and try and get over the shaft and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm about 30 seconds into that train of thought when this other boat comes pulling in in front of us about 200 feet away and a whole bunch of divers start putting on their, their dive gear. And I go, hey, guys, uh, can you, um, can you uh, come over and unstick my anchor? And they go, oh, yeah, we'll be there in about five minutes. Sure enough, five minutes later, I see my chain going chunk, 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 and I pull it up, and away we go. I've never felt so lucky in my life. I wish we had been somewhere where I could have bought a lottery ticket because that was uh, pretty amazing. Don't plan on that, okay? Okay, let's talk some enhancements. Uh, storm conditions, reducing swing, and maybe socializing. So Echo Bay. Friends of mine pulled in there in one April night, dropped their anchor, and uh, there were they said there were about four or five other boats in there at about three o'clock when they anchored. And by four o'clock, all of those other boats left, and they were the only ones left in the anchorage. And they went to went to bed, and about midnight, it started blowing at 60 knots, which obviously the other people had listened to the weather report and decided maybe they'd better head back to harbor. So they're in there anchored and they start dragging anchor. And so they get up and they reset the anchor and they futz with it all night. They tie to a buoy and they pulled the buoy loose. They, they had a very bad night. And I said, well, why didn't you just go across to Rolf Cove? The, the wind, by the way, was blowing the direction of the Red Arrow. Uh, if they'd gone into Rolf Cove or there over on Mesha, uh, they would have been in very protected waters and could have gone right back to sleep again. And they just didn't think of it. So if you can, you know, if, if things get ugly and you can get to a better anchorage safely, then then do it. If you don't think it's safe, then figure out to, how to deal with where you're at. Um, first thing to try, of course, is increasing scope or adding a second anchor. If you've got your, your secondary anchor, turn on the engine, drive up beside where your current anchor is, but off to the side ways, throw out the secondary anchor, and then back down so that you've got one anchor off of each uh, side of the bow, maybe at a 30 or 45 degree angle, uh, so that they're each taking half of the weight of the boat. Uh, so... And you don't have to get that exact. If it's blowing hard enough that it's dragging your primary anchor, it won't take very long before it starts pulling on the secondary um, and, and splits the load a little bit for you. Uh, the other thing you can do, and this only works if you know that you're, that you're expecting storm conditions, is to take your secondary anchor and unshackle it from the nylon line and then take the chain and the anchor on your secondary and shackle it to the top of the, or on, into the chain on your primary so that you drop your secondary anchor first and then drop your primary anchor so that you have two anchors in series. Now the advantage of this is that the, you can see the road on this, on your primary anchor is gonna be at whatever angle you've got for the amount of scope you have out. But that secondary anchor that's out in front of the primary anchor is going to have basically an infinite scope on it because it's gonna have uh, its attachment right down on the bottom. So you get a, a real good holding power out of that secondary anchor. So that's a, a good way of dealing with storm conditions if you if you know what's coming. Don't forget to add chafe gear if you need it. Uh, set an anchor alarm. Stand watch. Under those kind of conditions, you're not going to get much sleep anyway. And, of course, your major concern is, all right, am I um, dragging? But also take a, keep a real close eye on the people upwind of you. They may well, may well drag. Uh, just to give you a flavor of this, my wife and I uh, were on our way back from Alaska 
on Canada Day and we pulled into Montague Harbor and there were, you know, I don't know, 200 boats anchored in the area. It was a lot of boats. Uh, and we were up on that little beach north of the park. So we were, weren't in the main bay. And we were in the third row of boats off the beach and about 3, 3.30. And we got to watch another dozen boats anchor around us and, and out in the fourth and fifth rows from the beach before seven o'clock. And I, uh, I watched all of those boats anchor and I watched how far they, you know, I watched them drop to their, to where their anchor was on the bottom. And then I watched how far they backed up and I could, by watching their boat lengths against the shoreline, I could get a pretty good idea how much scope they put out. And it, exactly six, half of the boats that dropped their anchors backed up one boat length, which meant that they were on two to one or less of scope. So if the wind had come up during that night, none of them would have held. They all would have dragged. Uh, there was one other boat that put out about three to one and then started backing up on his anchor. He never did stop. Uh, the, in other words, he didn't get the anchor to set, but he just turned off his engine and decided it was good enough. So there were seven of those 12 boats that there I would not have trusted uh, in any kind of conditions. Fortunately, uh, it was a calm night, so no major harm done. But uh, a warning about what kind of anchoring skills there are uh, in the general public out there. And as I said, keep an eye on the neighbors. Okay, reducing swing. Why would you want to do it? Uh, maybe you want to anchor into a little tight spot, a little cubby hole. Uh, maybe you're anchoring on a sloped bottom. We do this a lot in Alaska because there's very few places where you can get a shallow enough bay to actually anchor on a flat bottom. <clears throat> and when you're anchoring on a sloped bottom like this, you can see, and I'll, and I'll do this. This is what it, all right, let me back up. So the, the, the anchor on the right, I put in here at a scope of three to one. And over on the left, it's three to one after the boat has swung around and the anchor is um, obviously not going to hold. But if I look at this from the anchor's point of view, that three to one scope relative to the bottom of that on that slope is more like a 10 to one. That's a really small angle. So that anchor is going to really hold if you can keep the pull up the hill. And so this is why you may want a stern tie if you're anchored on a sloped bottom to keep the pull on your anchor going up the hill. And you can reduce your swing by stern tying. You can reduce it by putting out a, a stern anchor. Now, if you put out a, a primary anchor and a stern anchor, don't just let your anchor roads hang loose like this, because if the current or the wind swings you around, you could end up uh, crossing and, and twisting your anchor roads together. So the way to prevent this is to just pull them up so that you got a little bit of tension on both of the uh, anchor lines or the, so, or the anchor roads so that they <clears throat> are keeping the boat going one direction. Here's a picture of a bunch of boats that stern tied up in Melanie Cove and, and they, I, I know that when this was taken and they were expecting a big blow that night. So rather than rafting together, uh, this flotilla uh, all dropped their anchors and, and stern tied to shore. Here's a picture of our boat um, out in Barkley Sound and it's kind of hard to see. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a reef here and over on the on the left side, and there was this little kind of a long little bay that we could kind of had a little protection in and a little hidey hole. So I dropped my primary anchor and backed up, and then I took my secondary out in the dinghy and dropped it behind us. And I'm holding the boat in position by just having the two two anchors out. Excuse me. 
Uh, here's a picture up in Alaska where we're anchored on one of those sloped bottoms. If you, if you, if we were to hop in the boat and, and go forward in the direction that the boat is pointing about 200 yards, the bottom is 600 feet deep. But there was a little bit of a stream coming in here, a little bit of a river, and it had created a little delta in the, in these deep waters. And so I basically dropped my anchor on the slope of that delta. And then you can see the stern tie line behind the rock here holding us so that our anchor is pulling up, uh, up on that slope. Now, rafting. There's multiple ways you can raft. Uh, you can have one boat put down a, a bow anchor and a stern anchor and have another boat just come tied to them. Uh, you can have uh, each boat drop a bow anchor and then go bow to stern with each other and, and raft. Um, <clears throat> the bottom one we did once with, we had two sailboats that both had swim steps on them. And so we both dropped our bow anchors and then just backed up to each other and put a couple fenders between us and then took dock lines and just tied the boats together uh, so that our swim steps were almost touching. And it made a great pl party platform. We had the two cockpits within talking distance of each other. We could easily walk from one boat to the other. And then at nighttime, uh, we just let the anchor lines out about four or five feet and the, and the pull of the anchor chains uh, pulled, kept the boats pulled apart so that we weren't bumping into each other if the wind came up during the night. So that worked kind of cool when you just had a couple of boats. <clears throat> and it also is reasonable. Uh, here's a picture where we had four boats and I believe my anchor on uh, the second boat from the left is the only anchor down for all four of these boats. Now, that's okay on a calm summer night. And the rule is that if the wind comes up and things get ugly, uh, that you, you start pounding on hulls and you wake up everyone else and everyone else has to go set their own anchor in the middle of the night. And we've definitely had to bust up rafts and do that. Not very often, uh, but it it does happen. So it is it is reasonable. Uh, you know, I you know I had seven to one out in this. I had a whole lot of of anchor out, uh, but again, it was summertime conditions. Now, if you do want to put out more than one anchor, then you don't want to have them both going the same direction. Uh, if we, if, in, if two of these boats had their anchors out and the wind shifted directions, you'd end up wrapping your chains around each other, which gets ugly. So if you're going to put out, if you're going to do this kind of thing and raft a bunch of boats together, what we usually do is we'll set anchors and then run stern tie lines to shore to keep the raft from swinging. Uh, if we're in an area where stern tying isn't practical, then we're going to set, uh, we're going to go back to the middle option here and have one boat put out bow anchor, another put out the bow anchor in the other direction so that you're now holding the raft and keeping it from swinging around. Uh, some tips, generally put down the largest anchor in the, in the group. If you're only going to put down one anchor, put down the one that has the most hold. Uh, put your fenders up at the tow rail level. Uh, this is the same picture we had in the docking clinic the last time we talked, but it's the same concept. Uh, make sure you're protecting the boats at the widest point where they tend to touch each other. Uh, generally, what we do is we have the boat that is coming into the stationary boat pretend that they're basically just pulling into a dock. So they'll have their fenders out, they'll have all their dock lines out, and they just pull up to the dock and then we tie it up with a bow line, a stern line, and two spring lines. Uh, and that way you can, you, you, that way you, the boat that's coming in is always using their lines. Uh, when they get ready to leave, they can just untie their lines and and or on you the other boat can untie their lines toss them to them and they leave and you, that way you don't run out of lines if you try and use all the lines of the boat that's already anchored and he has one on each side uh, it makes it a little more difficult uh, also on sailboats if you've got two sailboats coming in together uh, make sure that you stagger uh, the mass a little bit so that if a big wake comes by and the boats start rocking at a slightly different um, uh, 
pattern to each other that the mass don't swing into each other and, and break a spreader. And again, if the weather comes up, you're going to have, you know, the people are going to have to unanchor and, and go off and set their own anchor um, where it's practical. And that is it. Uh, the rest of it is um, just uh, learning opportunities. We've got the classes. Uh, again, that same, uh, you'll see the, uh, the, in the reprinted articles in 48 North that we told you about last time that it's on our website under about and resources. <clears throat> there's, there's articles, basically almost all of this information that I have in this presentation is presented in there on I think three different articles, one on anchoring, one on rafting, and one on, on um, stern ties and so forth, some of the enhancements. <clears throat>